<laughs> in her introduction. Um, but I do want to kind of um, share a few things with you all today. Let me set this up. And I kind of prepared like a mini PowerPoint just to kind of guide our thought. So I actually want to begin today by talking about kind of a famous um, anthropological study that happened in Africa. So essentially what happened is there was this foreign aid organization um, who learned of a famine in a nearby village. Um, they, I can't remember, it, it was like a intersect of like war and drought and they lost their crops and all their animals died. Um, and so there was mass starvation and this foreign aid organization was like, we got to help. Um, and so they met and they talked and they decided to give the village a bunch of chickens. And their thought process was um, there's this sustainable so they provide immediate food with eggs they reproduce rather quickly if you want to eat the meat you can eat the meat um, they don't require a lot of space or a lot of food so this is probably a really good resource um, to give this village so they give the village like two dozen chickens or something the villagers say like oh thank you this is really helpful um, and the foreign aid service workers, you know, go back to the city um, and two weeks later they come back to the village and every single chicken is gone. Um, and the foreign aid workers are like, what happened to the chickens? Um, and the villagers <laughs> kind of giggled and said, well, against our bright red dirt, white fluffy chickens are easy prey. <laughs> they were snatched up in the first couple days by uh, predators. So this is kind of a famous story um, in my line of research, uh, and it's actually kind of considered a comical story now because the easy solution is obviously ask the villagers, um, ask them what they need and what would be helpful because they knew what works and what doesn't work in their context. Um, so I had, so I tell this story because I actually um, thinks it kind of helps situate us and where we are in our journey as Lord of Life community a bit. Um, I had the privilege of meeting with our leadership team last week, I think it was now, um, and we were really talking about um, you know, since our last meeting, when we kind of wrapped up our conversation of the synod meetings, um, what, how, how do we move forward? What do we think about moving forward? And the conversation was a beautiful, rich dialogue about what steps would look like, what knowledge is for the steps. And as we were talking, as soon as we kind of ended the meeting, I immediately thought of this study because I kind of feel like we are these foreign aid workers, um, not necessarily the saver complex as much as we see a problem, we're talking about a problem, we're aware of the problem, um, and per perhaps we have ideas for solutions, um, but I'm not sure if we are about to just give a bunch of chickens. <laughs> Uh, which, you know, isn't harmful. Um, of course, there are acts that could be unknowingly harmful. Um, but maybe we should spend at least one more um, session. Really um, so we can kind of dive deeper into um, these rich, complex problems that we've been exploring lately. So that's kind of my goal for this little mini presentation is to give us the same foundation of language so we can really engage in rich dialogue and I intentionally use the word dialogue um, so we can have those richer meta conversations um, about what it means to move forward and what our core beliefs are and how that reflects the church big and little c. Um, okay, <laughs> so that's kind of my introduction. So I want to start with a really quick recap, and I think everyone I see here um, was here last week, so this is all probably just refresher for you guys. Um, so bias actually refers to a predisposition sorry, a predisposition towards something, and there's different types of bias, um, and everybody has every type of bias. It just, you know, how we're built. Um, and so there's positive bias and negative bias. And positive biases are things that you view favorably. I have a positive bias towards children. Um, I love the company of children. And negative biases are biases you have that give you a disposition of, uh, or gives you a negative disposition towards something. You also have explicit biases um, and implicit biases. Explicit biases are those biases that you're aware of, that you know of. I'm aware of my bias for children. Um, and implicit biases are really tricky because those are the biases that you don't know. Um, I believe Ted often calls these our blind spots. And I actually think that's a really awesome word is that these are our blind spots spots that we can't see. Um, in fact, it's easier for other people to see our blind spots and acknowledge our implicit biases than it is for us. 
Um, just a quick recap on how implicit biases start. I used the example of a dresser last time because it was behind me. Um, I'm on my bed, um, so there's no dresser behind me. So I, I often use the example of a storage unit, a storage facility. So this is your brain. As soon as you encounter something new, um, in order to learn, you put a little box. Um, and over, for each new encounter that you have, you fill your storage information with new boxes of information. Sometimes you'll rearrange the information within a single box. Sometimes you'll add new information into a box um, and you keep adding and adding with every lived experience you have. Um, and you know, by the time you're 30, 40, 50, your storage unit probably looks something like this. Your brain is so filled, packed of information and knowledge and interpretations and everyone organizes their storage unit differently. Um, and the tricky thing about implicit biases is those are the boxes that you first put in your storage unit. Um, these are the very first few boxes you put. So when you're, you know, even 10, 11, 12, and your storage unit is starting to look something like this, think about how hard it is to access that very first box you put in there. You have to do a lot of unpacking in order to access that box, in order to even remember it's still there or acknowledge that it exists there. Um, I actually was reading um, a book the other day, um, like literally yesterday, um, and they had this great parable about two fish in the sea, and there was an old wise fish and a younger fish, and the old wise fish says to the younger fish, tell me about the ocean, um, and the young fish is like, you know, I hear everyone talking about the ocean, but I'm not really sure um, what it is or like what they're talking about, and the old wise fish says, it's actually all around you. You can't see it because you're in it, and I really liked that parable when we're talking about implicit biases because it, oops, <laughs> if this is our mental framework, if this is how we organize and understand the information about the world, we're also living within this storage unit. So sometimes it's hard to know that there are things outside of the storage unit. For those of you who are familiar with Plato, it's kind of like the Platonic cave um, in a sense that if you are only living within the storage unit, you don't realize that there's something outside of it and it's hard to assess objectively the storage unit, the space from which you're in. So I just thought of the cool parable, I thought I'd throw it in here. Um, <laughs> so directly kind of, one thing I wanted to say, because a lot of these conversations were inspired um, through conversations about race, um, I wanted to really talk about how these implicit biases that develop these very first few storage boxes that we put into our mental framework um, aren't necessarily um, explicit negative things. So uh, you might develop a negative implicit bias against something um, without actually having not ever experiencing like a harsh explicit negativity. So to be a little bit more um, clear, sorry, I'm kind of like talking in circles a bit. Um, I have an example. So uh, I was participating in a research study in inner city DC with um, a predominantly black school. And it was about um, risk assessment with young children. We were working with um, very young children about age four about riding balance bikes and there's like a whole purpose for this about risk assessment and a lot of other stuff because um, risk assessment shall, if we sh we know that children who engage in risky play as young children are better able to engage in risk assessment as older adults and so we were like pilot testing some curriculum that would expose children to risky play um, in public school settings it's the whole thing but anyways so <laughs> we're working with these balance bikes um, with this predominantly black population and the biggest finding i think from the study the biggest problem we encountered was the helmets that were required because we were working in public school did not fit black girls hair. So, um, and it was a really big deal because if their hair was in pigtails or ponytails, um, it physically didn't go over their hair. If their hair was in braids, a lot of the girls were wearing beads. So it was really painful for the girls. And so nobody said anything negative. Nobody said you need to change your hair. You shouldn't have hair like this no one said anything terrible but what these children experienced was an obvious struggle because as someone who was putting these helmets on it was a struggle to get these helmets on these young girls um, and i bring this example up because 
a, it was a, a major finding within our study that helmets are not made for women at, or for certain hair types. Um, but if you recall within our very first meeting together, a young girl who identified as biracial mentioned that she was nervous about doing jumping jacks in karate classes because her hair bounced. So we see that immediate effect over how it might uh, make someone become self-conscious about their features, how we might have really deep rooted implicit biases about different hair types that weren't necessarily stemmed from an experience of someone saying your hair is wrong, but because the society or certain tools or the predominant features of the tools were, were not made in a way to cater to their diverse needs. Does that make sense? I'm going to pause for someone to ask, jump in and ask questions. Cool. Okay. <laughs> it seems to me that if I were designing a bicycle helmet for young children uh, in the year 2000, the year 2020 in the United States, I'd consider as a marketing person all my different market constituents, and all my market dem demographics. So our, our, this study is saying that, in fact, at least this one manufacturer did not actually consider, consider that as part of their, of their research before they went ahead and, and designed this helmet that didn't fit a certain percentage of the demographic. It's, it's so interesting that you bring that up because this was, like I said, a major finding. We had lots of conversations and we were not blessed with a marketer <laughs> in our research unit. So you could probably give us a lot of really great information. Um, but it wasn't just one type of helmet. It's bicycle helmets in general. And so I, I, I know nothing about marketing, um, but I'm hypothesizing that in terms of at looking for your target audience, you'd probably look at the demographic who engage in cycling. Um, black women are the least likely to engage in demographic. And it does become a little bit of a chicken of an egg thing about which comes first. Do black women generally not care about uh, cycling or is cycling not suited, the dominant features of cycling not suited to cater to black women's needs? Um, that was kind of a loaded question, sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there's not a lot of black women who cycle. Um, and the few who do, do have to do their hair in a particular way. Either they have a different hair texture, um, they relax their hair, or they do something. And I know um, just in, in terms of our research, a lot of families don't feel comfortable doing chemical treatments on four-year-old children's hair. Um, and of course, the longer you prolong a child's exposure to a certain activity or sport, the less likely they are to engage in that. And so when we look at, generally speaking, when families start becoming more comfortable doing chemical treatments in girls' hair, um, they're older and less likely to kind of pick up new sports. But of course, there comes that whole issue of why do we have to subject young girls to chemical treatments just so they can ride a bike? Um, yeah, but oh, it's and just to follow on to that, then, and and then I'll be quiet. Is that all? <clears throat> all of um, all marketing is filled with explicit bias. And, and therefore, it does in fact demonstrate that there is, uh, in, in that part of our culture, to my way of thinking, uh, a particular explicit bias uh, that may have implicit history, but an explicit bias toward a particular type of demographic. All we need to do is turn on the, tel the television at any point in time, and you can see how marketing has focused itself um, in various ways to a set of spe uh, specific explicit biases. Um, so I think that those messages, therefore, reflect themselves on, let's just say, young inner city black girls. <laughs> that can't get a doggone bicycle helmet to fit. And they, they get that. They yeah, see but, that. But they, they learn that. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, but these girls were willing to ride bikes and they were excited to ride bikes. Um, that the material wasn't suited for them. So I don't know if I'm misunderstanding you. No, I'm, I'm saying exactly that. I'm saying that the hat designer marketing team get together and the manufacturer that's part of that 
they 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 apply an explicit bias when they design that helmet. They say that that demographic, young black girls in the city don't ride bicycles or can't afford bicycles. Therefore, we're not gonna design helmets around them. Yeah, yes, like yes. Old white guys like me can't ride, can't wear a Speedo, so I can't wear a Speedo. <laughs> I don't know. Have you been to Europe? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yes, yes, you're you're totally right. Um, there is, and that was like one of our big kind of findings. And this is kind of like digress. Is like someone needs to get on it. We need engineers to get on this. And there were some like prototypes, but they're like absurdly expensive, and you know, not no one's gonna fund a two thousand dollar helmet for inner city girls for a risk assessment study, you know, <laughs> like that's not happening. Um, but yes, so, you know, Ken, if you ever find anything, I might, I might give you a call <laughs> to help us out with marketing. Um, anyways, moving on. Okay, so let me look at my notes real quick. I had a transition here. I wanted to make it clean. Oh, yes. Okay, so a lot of these implicit biases that we develop are not necessarily a result of explicit racism or explicit sexism. Um, a lot of times it is systemic. It's the way the society in which we live in was designed. Um, so what do we do then? How do we move forward knowing that we have these implicit biases? Um, what can we do to kind of counteract them? So I have here, and I mentioned this last week, and I think I mentioned it a couple of times because it's a tool I use a lot, the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity. And there are a couple of different versions uh, or different models for um, intercultural sensitivity or intercultural competence. Yes, ma'am. I just want to remind you, if you haven't noticed, we have a number of people are on phone, so they may not be able to see this, just so I wanted to make sure you were aware of that yeah. as, you, as you talk this through. I'm so glad you said that. So um, I will talk through each stage and explain everything verbally for those of you on phone. Um, so there are a couple different models. Uh, this one is my favorite, uh, and I find it a wonderful tool to basically learn about your own biases. Um, so there's never going to be a manual about how to not be biased anymore um, because you will always have biases no matter what you do. You're never going to counteract all your biases. But what this tool does is give you um, a tool. I didn't mean to reuse that word. <laughs> what this framework does is it provides you a tool to help yourself learn when you encounter new biases. Um, just kind of like a side note here. Um, the current conversation is around black culture. And I know we are a predominantly white community and we can learn as much as we want about dominant features of black culture and dominant experiences within black culture. But at the end of the day, the black experience is not monolithic. There's not a singular black experience. Each person experienced their blackness differently. Additionally, the black experience is not the only marginalized experience. Um, the world, and our country is filled with diverse ways of being. Um, and it is impossible to really study and learn every single thing about every single uh, marginalized culture because there are so many and there are so different. So what this tool does is it helps you adapt to each encounter that you experience. So what is this tool? The developmental model of intercultural sensitivity. So there's two main sections and six steps. So the two, the first section is an ethnocentric, and this is viewing the world through your own lens. And the second section is ethnorelative, the acknowledgement that your reality is your own experience. And within this first ethnocentric stage, you or ethnocentric kind of paradigm, um, you have three stages. And then the ethnorelative paradigm, you have three more stages. Um, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what each of these stages are, because I think it's really useful to think about where you are um, and kind of play with the way you respond to different um, issues and different struggles to kind of identify where you are and how you can grow and in which ways, what questions you need to be asking yourself. So to begin with, we have denial. So this is the very first stage of intercultural competence. And I have a little image for those of you who can't see of a little toddler crossing their arms with a big pouty face. And I have that because when I think of denial, this is kind of what I think of. So the stage of denial is denying that there are any possible way, other possible ways you can view the world. So for any of you who have had a conversation with a young toddler and you're like, oh, <laughs> the sky is blue. And they're like, no, it's green. And you're like, no, no, it's blue. And they're like, no, green. 
um, and they will not budge and they're, they won't even acknowledge that you can think differently. Um, that's what denial is. Um, it's just the outright denial <laughs> that there can be any other types of thinking. Um, the second stage is defense. And I put a schoolhouse here because most of you know at this point, I work a lot in education and our current educational paradigm situates us to be in the defense stage. So most Americans are here in this defense stage, the second stage of the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity. And what this stage really is, is you acknowledge that there are other ways of thinking. Some people will say the sky is blue, some people will say it's green, but at the end of the day, only one is right. And most likely this is your way. Your way is right, everyone else is wrong or anyone else who says otherwise is wrong. Um, I also put this little cartoon because I kind of think this is why politics ends up the way it is because we raise our children um, in schools that encourage the defense um, mindset and we are resulted with adults who are unable to engage in rich conversation and instead just disagree. Um, and they can't move forward from that disagreement. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Um, and we can't move forward. And that's what the defense stage is. Um, I can go on for ages about this. I won't go on too much further, um, but this is where a lot of my analysis takes place. So the next stage is minimalization. And I kind of talked about this um, last or two weeks ago. Um, I told the funny story about I got sick in Cambodia. Um, my host mother gave me fish soup because she was trying to be kind and that's what she eats when she is sick. And as an American, fish soup was like repulsed, like not what I wanted when I was nauseous. Um, and of course, whenever I came back to the United States, I had met my husband who's Thai and his mother who's Thai um, gets sick. And I try to be a good daughter-in-law and I give her bread because that's what I think. I would want if I'm sick um, and chicken noodle soup. And she's like, thanks, and goes and gets fish because um, that's what she eats when she is um, not feeling well. So minimalization is really this, a lot of times we hear it in common rhetoric as colorblind. At the end of the day, we're all red-blooded humans. We're all the same. We all need the same things. We all need love and support. Um, the problem with this stage is that it's still in the ethnocentric paradigm. And so that means we view what we think other needs through our own lens. So this example that I provide of like the fish and the chicken soup um, is harmless. It's done in good faith. Um, and everyone involved in both of those scenarios, I think knew it was done in good faith. Um, but you can very quickly see how this bec can become problematic. Um, I think a lot in terms of of course, I work in education. So when you think about teaching and you have two children with very diverse needs, you're going to interact with those children differently. So um, think about a child who really, really struggles with literacy and a child who really excels with literacy. If you treat them the exact same, one will thrive and one will suffer. If you change your instructional methods to cater the needs of the individual children, they will both thrive. Um, and so minimalization can get really challenging. Another issue with minimalization um, is it devalidates opposing perspectives. And so what, what that means is, um, I'm gonna use the current you know, um, social situation to kind of analyze this further. So as a white person, I don't have a lot of problems with police. Um, whenever I'm stopped by the police, really, I can bat my eyelashes um, and I'm fine. <laughs> like I've maybe gotten a, like two tickets once. Um, not a big deal. I kind of, yeah, that's just my experience with police. Um, and so if that's my experience, if I'm engaging with minimalization, if someone comes to me and says, that's not my experience at all, I have a very different experience with police. Um, this is my encounterment. If I'm engaging through minimalization, I'm gonna say, no, that's not true. That's not what my experience is. And you and I were the same. At the end of the day, we're the same. If we act the same, if we behave the same, we're gonna be the same, you're wrong. Um, so that's the trouble with minimalization is we devalidate what people say that doesn't correspond with our own lived experiences, even though we think we're the same. Um, any questions there? Okay, so now we cross the Rubicon to ethno-relative understandings. Um, 
And ethno-relative understandings is the understanding that your reality is your own experience. So for those of you, I meant to say this earlier and I apologize, I forgot. Uh, for those of you who might be into more of this type of language, ethnocentrism is more along the lines of post-positivism um, and ethno-relativism is more along the lines of constructivism. Um, just different kind of language, depending on like what language you prefer. Um, and so this is the acknowledgement that your lived experiences construct your own reality. So the way you move through life is not the way I move through life. Um, what you believe is not the same thing I believe and no one's really right or wrong. They're just different. And they're probably a result of our lived experiences or our culture, um, where we come from, our family life, et cetera, et cetera. And so the first stage in this paradigm, and sorry, my visual, for those of you who can see the visual, got caught off there, um, <laughs> which is the fourth stage in the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity is acceptance. And this is exactly what it sounds. It is accepting that there are other ways to perceive the world. Um, for those of you who can see the PowerPoint, I have an image of a culture project or a culture fair project. Um, and I think this kind of perfectly embodies what acceptance is. It's the acknowledgement that there is differences. And then that's kind of it. There's not necessarily, not, one's not necessarily right or wrong. Um, and you don't really know what to do. It's just like at the end of the day, we're different. Like what, what do I say? We're different at the end of the day. Um, this does come develop some ethical problems um, and a lot of people who are experiencing time in this phase sometimes kind of feel like they're drowning like oh my god is anything real <laughs> what's going on um, but anytime you go to one of those culture fairs um, and i've hosted and this is not to talk down on culture fairs i've hosted a lot of these culture fairs um, but they are generally superficial in their um, introduction to different cultures um, and they don't really go much beyond food fashion and uh, there was like one other f that they kind of work around food fashion and i don't know funnies i don't know um, <laughs> But um, so acceptance is basically a culture fair. There are differences and we're going to leave it at that. You don't, you can't really work with them um, unless it's through your own lens. So the fourth, or sorry, the fifth stage is adaptation. And I have here uh, some pictures of the guys doing like the walk of in the mile in her shoes. Um, some of y'all might have heard of that. It's for those of you who can't see, it's a couple of men and girls, high, women's high shoes, um, and they're walking to show solidarity with women. Um, but I chose this issue because adaptation is the ability to put yourself in someone else's position. So how would you feel if you how to do that. How would you feel if you had to walk a mile in six inch high heels? You know, have you tried it? Maybe you should try it. I also think a lot about my initial Peace Corps experience, particularly my training. Um, they told us to eat like Kamai, dress like Kamai, act like Kamai, um, and I felt like I was going through all the motions. I was putting myself in their position. Um, and I use the word position and not perspective because I was experiencing the world they might do so in their place, but still through my own perspective. Um, and then the last stage is adaptation. And sorry, it's like not even, you can't even see it. Oh, wait. Um, in integration, sorry, um, is integration. Um, and I put a, for those of you who can't see, a visual reference of a storage unit with boxes because integration is the ability to see somebody else's perspective. Um, a lot of times when people talk about integration in reference to the DMIS, um, they talk about being able to fluidly flow in and out of cultural experiences. Um, so understanding not just what it's like to be in a woman's shoes, but understanding how certain women process and perceive the world. So you really have to get to know in this society, in this culture, how is their storage unit developed? What boxes do they have in there? And then once you know that, then you can also also walk the mile um, and really understand how that culture works and how they perceive, how they engage in reasoning, epistemology and ontological understandings as well. So this is the goal, obviously. Um, one thing I will say about Bennett is they do, the Bennett, sorry, is the author or the developer of this framework um, and he does, or they um, do 
obviously say that integration it, integration is the goal. That's where we eventually want to be. Um, but there are some other really awesome authors out there who lean this way for readers out there. Uh, Martha Nussbaum is one of my favorite. She is a um, female philosopher, which you don't hear a lot of. <laughs> so I like saying those. Um, and she's still living and she's still doing a lot of work today. Um, but also there's some like awesome veterans like Foucault walks in this vein, as does uh, Paulo Freire. So if any readers out there, um, let me check the time real quick. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we're doing it. Okay. So that is the DMIS and those are the different stages. Um, and I want you to take a moment to think about kind of where you are. Um, and I don't want, and, and I want to be really serious about this. Everyone works through this and there's no shame in any place in which you are. We're all working through this together. And I know for myself, I've always felt like I've been further along than I am. So I'll always be like, oh, I'm in like stage, you know, like four or I'm in stage five. And then I'll have an experience and be like, whoa, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, I am stage two still. Um, so there's no shame in any stage, but it is a journey that we need to work together to move forward um, in our ability to understand diverse perspectives. And this is a great tool to help us situate our own understandings. I'm gonna pause for a second. Any questions or comments about the DMIS? It seems to me that uh, one could be in various parts of the DMIS, depending upon the particular cultural uh, aspect or, convent or convention or, or event that you're considering. In other words, when I think about um, anti-racism, uh, I might be in one of these phases, but when I think about um, house painting, I, I might be in another, to use an absurd uh, uh, analogy, but I, th I think it, it's, there's ways of applying the, these rules that affect us differently depending upon the particular aspect of of our culture or, or our theology or, or wherever we might be. There's not, in other words, one size does not fit all. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I will say that that's actually not the case. Um, you cannot be in multiple stages at one time. Um, but, but I see what you're saying. So depending on what your perspective is on a different issue, you might be more dogmatic in some realms than you are in another. Um, but why that doesn't necessarily fit, I'm gonna kind of go back to the initial so we can look at the DMIS. Why that does not actually fit in the DMIS because the, uh, this model talks about your, your whole um, storage unit. So not those individual boxes, but your storage unit and your approach to house painting or anti-racism are those individual boxes. So th what this talks about is, well, how is your storage unit organized? Um, you might have boxes that are organized in certain ways, but what I would actually really argue is if you feel you are defense in um, one issue and you feel your adaptation in another issue, that other issue that you feel like your adaptation is, your definition or um, yeah, definition of acceptance might just be more broad. So it's still actually functioning within the defense framework, your just definition is wider. But I'm glad you brought that up because that's a common question. Also, another common question I get. Oh, sorry, you were going to say something. Go ahead. Oh. I said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, I have a question. Uh, that's that's a lot of um, that's a lot of material to uh, to contemplate for sure. So you're so you're saying that you have I have uh, I'm in one of these places. All of us are in one of these places. And even if we're looking at different parts of society or our culture, uh, and we might feel like we're in another place, we may not really be there. It's just that we've chosen to expand or, const or constrict uh, our perspective on each one of those. Yes, exactly. That was beautiful. I wish it's recorded, right? <laughs> Someone write that down. <laughs> Is there like, do you, what's the language for it? Do you, is it just a growth model or can you go, like, can you have an experience in an event that like moves you back down towards like denial and like live there forever? 
That's a good question. That's also, that was the one next one I was going to get because I think the second most asked question, I think. Um, so generally it's considered, the way Bennett described or developed it is it is a linear progression. Um, there's not necessarily a backtrack. Um, I haven't, I've heard that question a lot from students. I haven't ever read any evidence of that in literature. Not to say it's not out there, I just haven't come across it. Um, also, and just so you all know, other critiques of this, um, it was developed by a Western researcher, so there might be Western leans. So that's another thing to, you know, we're talking about the way we organize our um, <laughs> uh, storage unit. This was developed by a person with a storage unit. So it was organized by their storage unit. So it does probably have a Western lean. Um, and uh, another kind of critique of it is that it is a linear one directional. Um, I haven't seen any evidence that people move backwards, but I've seen a lot of conversation of is intercultural sensitivity really this lin linear or is it more like, uh, I'm thinking of more like the intersectionalities chart. I think I shared it with you all before to where it's not linear. It's like a, like a spider web almost, um, which I have seen a few other models that are that resemble that better or resemble spider webbing or something like that more. Um, I, this one is still, the one I use most and one that I would argue is probably most widely accepted um, in my realm of work. I, I have a question. Sorry, go ahead. The question is, how do you know that you are there? How do you know that you are in the integration phase and that you're not only cheating yourself? Uh, I don't know, can I take a test? <laughs> or how do I measure it? And yeah. The other one is, how do we apply it? How, we, how do you make it actionable? Yeah, that's really good. Those are both great questions. Okay, first question, um, I'm not aware of a test. Um, I would actually kind of argue that a test would not be compatible because tests generally um, are developed in, like the notion of evaluation is a ethnocentric notion. Um, so it doesn't even correspond with the ethno relative portion of the paradigm. Um, however, I think a great kind of starter for yourself is think about here. Let me actually ask you all this question. Oh, I'm trying to think of how to word it. Um, I don't want to say how do you define marriage, but yeah, how, how, how do you define marriage? I think I think of marriage as a partnership between two willing parties. <laughs> two willing parties, so it has to be two. Or maybe, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, when I said two, I paused there for a moment. <laughs> I mean, if there are more willing parties, who am I to say no? <laughs> yeah, that's a great start. Um, so I was actually reading the same article that I was reading about the fish story. Um, this professor proposed that question to her students um, at the start of every semester. And she would always say that it usually started, this was back before um, same-sex marriage was legalized in the United States. And students would usually start with like, a union between a man and a woman and she would provoke further to explore concepts of um, polygamy and same-sex marriage and trans marriage and other the many different dynamic forms of marriage um, and she talked a lot about how that was really hard for people to digest because marriage is something that we think about as that we know but whenever you kind of dive deeper it's one of those things that's kind of in the back of our storage unit i would argue you know this is before um same-sex marriage was legalized um so i would say it's a little bit more forefront in probably our generation now having experienced that politically um, but i still think it's kind of a great starting point the pur purpose of all this is when you experience something or when you hear someone say something that is starkly different from anything you have experienced before, what is your initial response? Another great example is, okay, if I say 22 plus 53 is 78, 
what is your response? What are the numbers? That's incorrect. <laughs> That's my response. Yes. So the general response is, well, you're wrong. Um, that is a leaning towards ethnocentric perspective because that is the belief that there is one objective correct. If your response is, well, how did you get that? Then you're leaning to an ethno-relative perspective because you acknowledge the process in which someone thinks through something um, defines what the answer is. Um, that was also kind of a trick question because we are taught in math is considered to be um, really neutral and anti-racist within and of itself, and it is very much not. <laughs> math is actually incredibly racist. <laughs> um, um, and the way we teach math uh, is very much in the defense, and I kind of already went over how our whole education system is in the defense. I'm sorry, Ken. I, I just had an epiphany, and I, I could be totally off on this, but it, this very much sounds like a Western dualistic way of looking at the world. Not, not this model, but the way I look at the model, I'm looking at it and trying to understand it from a we, they, I, you model. And I wonder if that has um, an influence on how this model actually can apply itself to, let's say, those of us in the United States. If we live in a dualistic world, we, they, me, them, how do we get beyond that? Because this is not dualistic. That's the idea, isn't it? Yeah, if someone wants to say something, go ahead. She said that was the idea of the model. Uh, that, it's, I, I, that it's not dualistic. What do you mean by dualistic? You're unmuted. Me, you. Us, them, we, they. This model oh, okay. that we, there is no other way of looking. It's like the whole theological dualistic way of looking at the world, right? It was, it was us and them. That's how Christianity grew up as a we, them kind of thing. Mm -mm. Yeah. And so that our, our whole Western, there are arguments that would say that our whole Western uh, culture is built around the dualistic way of looking at the world as opposed to a more universal way. And I would argue that this model looks to me more universal than it does dualistic. That's all I'm saying. Yes, yes. I think I just didn't understand you. Yes, 110%. Yeah. Um, and I kind of talked, I think, like several weeks ago about the um, Enlightenment era and how it kind of sparked that, uh, what you're calling a uh, dualistic perspective. Um, I do think it I don't know enough about theology. I'm not going to pretend like I do. Um, from my very, 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 very limited experience, I, I do see roots in different types of theology. Um, but I also think that this is why I really want to participate in these conversations in this setting, is I think this is something really, really valuable for us to explore. Um, I don't know. Julia, do you have anything to add, Pastor Julia? Not about that. I had another thought brewing, so that might be not helpful. <laughs> Oh, well, okay, so this is looking at the individual. So then my question was, can this also apply then to like a congregation? Like, can you look at the congregation as an individual moving through those stages? Or do you look at the individuals of a congregation itself? I'm not sure if I have a right answer. I would say probably, probably, I think we can look at it as a congregation 100%. Because I think about when you think about like a norms of a society, what mm -hmm. are the if those norms are catering towards integration, then those are the norms. Actually, I have a funny story. Um, it's funny you say that. I'm glad you said that. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit uh, to what the next part is because it's very much related to what you said. Um, so when we're talking about integration, and this goes a lot with what, Kadiri, your second question was about like, what do we move, how, what do we do with this? Like once we have this, how, what are our actionable steps? Well, the actionable, actionable steps are in our everyday experiences. Um, it's the big things, 
and the little things. And I would actually argue the little things are more significant than the big thing. Eh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> um, are just as significant as the big things, although they are not recognized as such. Um, so we all hear about those marching, mar about the marches, about big protests. Those are the big things. But those little interactions are just as important because it's those little interactions sometimes that are the ones that are creating the boxes in your brain. Um, if you're interested in more literature, Dr. Lee. He used to work with the Fred Rogers Foundation. He's now a professor at Harvard. Um, he talks a lot about, he coined them small interactions in early childhood about these really things as simple about how you talk, what words you select change the way the boxes form significantly. Um, and the perfect example I just gave with, you know, with math, um, if I give a incorrect answer to a math problem, if the teacher says you're wrong, um, you're training the child to develop a ethnocentric understanding of the world. If you say, how did you get there? You're training the child to have an ethno-relative perspective of the world. Um, I bring this up in relation to uh, what you said, Pastor Julia, because um, many of you know I'm relatively new to the church, um, I started attending the services, um, I think back in January, and I went to a new member meeting. Um, and the reason I actually decided to stay at our church was because of a really teeny tiny, and I'm glad he's not here because I keep still talking about him, <laughs> really teeny tiny comment that uh, Pastor Nathan said. Um, he was talking something about how the church was helping with refugees, and he was spinning dark, uh, Pastor Julia, you were there. I don't know if you remember this. Um, <laughs> um, he was spending probably too much time being like, there was this one family. Where were they from? Were they from? They weren't from Syria. They weren't from, where were they from? And like an awkward amount of time, right? Um, and finally someone goes, okay, it doesn't matter. There are people. <laughs> and he goes, no, it does matter because there are people from places. And that's why I decided to come back to the church um, because that statement in and of itself beautifully embodies what ethno-relativism is, that they're not just people. Um, they're people from places with history um, and perspectives. And so kind of going along the lines of what um, I was responding to you, Pastor Julia, in terms of the congregation is a body of people with norms. If the norms are around integration, if the norms is we address people at people as people from places with histories, um, then I do think we can say that our congregation is somewhere on the spectrum. Um, I also wanted to say, um, also kind of along the lines answering Kadiri's question, I dropped a link, a, um, what's it called? I'm gonna exit out of this for a minute. Um, an article, I'm not sure if all of you all had it. I'm gonna drop it again. I think it's a really, awesome article. It's by an author named Whitley. It's not an article. It's an essay. Um, it's two and a half pages. It's a relatively easy read. Um, let's see if I can find it. I'm not good it, at multi. It's in the chat box. Yeah, I think, uh, can everyone see it? I'll drop it just in yeah. case. They, uh, the people on, on phones may not have access to it. Maybe so we can People could, um, if you have my email address, which is posted, usually associated with these meetings, G-A-Y-L-E-J-08 at Gmail. Not that you're gonna remember that, but it's, if you email me and you want a copy or, or, of the link um, or the PDF, let me know. Just email me and I'll make sure that you can get a copy. Um, but the article does, I think does a really good job about discussing the importance of authentic listening. And in terms of what we can do moving forward, it's really about authentic listening. And we could not really time this better than the sermon we had on Sunday. Um, we're talking about slightly different things, but it perfectly matched with what um, the Reverend Dr. Swinson Reinhold was talking about in her service. And I think she provided actually the a wonderful example of her daughter who saw she was having a bad day and washed the dishes. And she was like, oh my God, you're doing this. <laughs> and the daughter responded, um, I hear you. I don't always agree, but I hear you. I think that's really valuable because another thing to remember here is all because you reach integration doesn't mean you necessarily agree with everything. It means you understand the perspective. Um, <laughs> I, I believe her name is, um, it, anyways, this one's still right whole daughter, Emma, I believe. Um, <laughs> um, Emma, what she demonstrated is authentic listening, really being able to hear, and then, you know, the thought of, you know, not 
participating sometimes, you know, even in something as small as like washing the dishes. Um, but what Whitley really talks about is kind of some tools and tips about how to practice integration. And one of the things she said is, um, listen, when people talk, don't listen for what you agree with, listen for what surprises you. Um, and I often say, which you can tell by my question, you know, two weeks ago is listen for what makes you uncomfortable because that is the important part that you need to spend time on um, in order to develop, to develop an understanding for not only their position in adaptation, but their um, perspective in integration. Um, I do also have some, I'm gonna share one more time and I promise I'm almost done, I'm so sorry guys. Um, oops. I do have one other little slide I wanna show you all. Um, just kind of some questions to ask for yourself. In addition to the Whitley article, um, when you're engaging with an action, when you're organizing an event, who benefits and who's getting left out? I think this is really important. Another way to frame this is who is the audience? Who is not the audience? And who is not the audience is just as important of a question of who is the audience. Um, and I actually think uh, it's funny that I'm glad you brought up the helmets, Ken, uh, and the marketing because like, I think this is, yeah, you were totally onto something there. Um, <laughs> uh, what is the true purpose? And I think this will surprise you a lot. Sorry, were you gonna say something? I was just gonna say that it looks very Sufi to me. What does Sufi mean? Uh, you know, the, the Eastern, Middle Eastern, ancient Middle Eastern philo philosophical way of looking at the world. Oh, yeah. Oh, very cool. I should know more and I just don't. <laughs> I'll have to do some studying. Um, yeah, what is the true purpose? And I think this will surprise you a lot. I will kind of draw us back. One, one of the things I really liked about the Synod presentations is the very last one when they were talking about, well, what do you value? Well, how do you spend your money and time? When I asked what is the true purpose of maybe an event, um, if you're telling someone about it, what are you telling them? Because that's the true purpose. Um, who am I accountable to? And I think this is really, really important. Um, and I think this surprises us too. I think it's always important to have someone check on us because remember, we don't see our implicit biases and we can't have someone with a like mind checking on us because they, they probably have the same implicit biases. We need someone of a different mindset checking on us, uh, holding us accountable, who's willing to call us out. And sometimes that is a physical person who talks to us. Sometimes that is the news network that you avoid constantly. Um, and sometimes that is the Facebook friend or great aunt who you never want to look at or niece who you never want to look at. Reading, not deleting them from your friend, friend post and feed and hearing what they have to say and hearing their perspective um, is still really valuable. Um, and finally, ask questions, be open to feedback. Um, and I, I just can't kind of stress the importance about that enough. You should grow and change. Um, and if you look back in the past five years and you're like, how have I changed? And you're unable to acknowledge it, you might be kind of stuck in an ethnocentric stage um, because you should be changing in an ethno-relative stage, not necessarily like your beliefs should change, um, but you should be expanding and growing and learning, if that makes any sense. Uh, maybe your beliefs change, maybe they don't, um, <laughs> but your knowledge should be expanding um, and your empathy should be growing. I'm kind of rambling at this point and making no more sense, so I will conclude. Does anyone have questions or comments? And thank you guys for listening. I do want to make one more comment.